word this morning? Nobody. All right. Let's just go. We'll just go home today. You know the word? What's the word today, buddy? <laughs> Chocolate chip cookies. <coughs> so we were talking. Uh, light in the darkness is kind of where we ended off last week, and I've tried to kind of segue into something new. And um, some of you that came to some of the leadership classes, today will be a little bit of maybe review for you. And that's okay, but um, you might not have known, but if you came to the leadership classes, I, I tricked you. You were my guinea pigs for something that I've been working on for a long time. And it was good information, wasn't it? Um, so I won't, I'm not going to go over exactly that stuff because um, I, I don't think that that's maybe appropriate for a Sunday morning. Um, but I'm going to use some of those principles from that. And so... We're going to talk today about what is church, and I don't have my, I didn't make an intro slide, I guess, but that's okay. So I've been talking for a while, or I've been thinking for a while um, about this, about just doing the book. We talked about that at the end of the sermon last week, and just, if we just, someone puts you, we put the 40 of us, or how many are here with the kids today, and we just, we're on a deserted island, and we've never been to a church before, and we had just landed there, crash landed, and we go up on the beach, and here's this book. And it says, you know, this is all you'll ever need to live off of. Everything, all the information that you ever need is right here. And if we just read this book, and we started our church, what would that church look like? And so that question has bothered me for, a, a, really since the start of this church, and it continues to bother me, and it continues to, to just poke at me, because I don't think that the church would look anything like it looks today. And I think our church is very different in the fact that it has, you know, bivocational leaders, it has, a, you know, a, um, a board, board-led decision-making process, it has, you know, people that are, are free in spirit. Our worship is, is pretty free here. Would you agree with that? Like there's not a lot of like oppression or religious activity here. It's just us trying to connect with the creator of the universe. And so I really like that. I, I love that we're different. I love that this church, you, you come in here and you know that it's different. The first time you came here, you probably knew that this was a little bit different place than other places that I've been. Um, but it still bugs me because I'm not sure that we're, we're here. I think we could be better. I'm not, I'm not, I want to say, I don't want to tell you that I'm at all frustrated with where we are as a church, because I'm not. But I just want what, what God wants. I just want to do what's in here. And I don't want to do anything else. And that's, that's my great struggle. And so, a lot of people's favorite sermon series, I keep, I get comments from my family back home, I get comments from people here. They loved when I did the burning ones. Remember that sermon series we did over the summer about just being on fire for God? And, um, People really enjoyed that, and that came out of when I was in Oklahoma City. I went there for an IPHC event uh, for evangelism directors, and I I went, and there was this guy there named Michael John, and he was uh, from India. It's a funny name for a guy from India, right? Um, Michael John, and so he had, um, his family had been, had gotten saved, and or his dad was a, a preacher, and he got saved as a young man. And they had basically, they had over there a church compound. And so when they got somebody saved, they would pull them out of their home life and bring them into the church compound because it wasn't really safe uh, in this country full of Hindu and in the north full of Muslims. Uh, to be, it wasn't real safe to be a Christian. And so they'd pull them out of their family and into this compound and they'd never see their family again. It was like, if you... W- sold out to Jesus, you were sold out to Jesus. You were completely separated from the world. And he realized at some point that that was totally against what it says in this book. Because if you look through Acts over and over and over again, you see a guy gets saved. Someone gets saved, and then it says immediately, and his whole family got saved that day. So what happened? The guy got saved, and he went home and did what? Yeah, he showed his wife and his kids and his aunts and uncles and his parents and his brothers and 
all of a sudden everyone knew Jesus. And it was like, wow. He read that. He kept reading those stories over and over again. And he said, someone cheated me. They took me away from the danger. And all I read in the book of Acts is when someone got saved, all they did was run in to a burning building and try to save as many people as they could. And he was telling the story, and I was thinking, man, he just wanted to do the book. He, he had known one church structure his entire life. He had known one way to do it, and all he wanted to do was just go back and do the book. And so he did. He left the compound, and he started his own church. And he got one person saved, and instead of bringing that person into his fold and trying to protect him and all those things, he said, first thing you do, you're saved. Yeah, I need five people. You got to write down five people you got to tell about Jesus this week. And they met in houses. And when they had too many people, they met in another house. So they had two. Met in three houses. Met in four houses. And six years later, they had 200 houses. And they have this compound to, hel to hold meetings. And they have like seven, 800 people that show up to their weekly meetings. Yeah, it's actually in one, it's actually in a Hindu holy city. So they have the, you know, the Ganges River runs right through the city. And it's one of the places where people will come. And they believe that if you die, you have to end up in the River Ganges or else you're going to hell. That's what they believe. And so the people come to that city to be cremated and spread their ashes in the river. So the river is absolutely filthy. Um, so they're doing this in one of the holy cities of Hinduism. They're doing this. It's amazing. And uh, so I heard that, and I was just inspired. I came back. I was, on, I was already thinking of this Burning One series, but that's what really set me on fire. That's where Burning Ones came from. And with the Seven Souls Challenge, you guys remember doing that over the summer and all those things. And so I don't want to stop doing that stuff. I don't want to stop reaching these people that are around us. I love more than anything to see people come to Jesus. And like a close second is to see people get closer to Jesus <laughs> and grow in their relationship with them. Like I love watching you guys because I, I can literally, some of you, I can watch you grow week to week. It's like with my kids. You know, some, some days I'll go to work in the morning. Some of you parents maybe experience this. And I come home in the afternoon and it's like that child is not the same child that, that was here this morning. Like they grow that fast. They learn new words. They learn new sentences. They have different personalities. And it's like, wow, how did that happen? It's, it's God. That's how God has designed the world. But the same thing with Christians too. I can watch some of you grow. And I see some of you go through growth spurts. And I see some of you go through struggles. But I love watching you grow. I love watching myself grow. I love to see what God is doing with us. But I have a problem, okay? I have a problem, and I'm guessing you have this problem too. See, I have some of my friends, I have this list of people in my backpack that, I, that I've been praying for, okay? And some of them I know have a church background. I know that if I invited them to church, they, they, they would come, or if I wanted to talk with them about Jesus, they would have that conversation with me. But there's some people on my list that that is not true for. Um, there's some people when... I would go up to them and I could ask them, what do you think about church? What do you think about church? What do you think some of the answers I would get for that question? It's too, too what? I'm sorry, still? Oh, it's too late for me. Okay. Full of hypocrites, right? They're brainwashed. Yeah. Okay. What else? A cult. Okay. I, we've, we've been called that before. <laughs> <laughs> Building will collapse if I go in there. Okay, I've heard that too. Yep. The holy water will burn me. I've heard that one too before. Um, this is things that I hear. Full of people that are holier than thou. <laughs> They're hypocritical. They're fake. It's a waste of my time. It's a crutch. It's unnecessary. People are mean, they're judgmental, they're overbearing. It's too structured for me. It's too religious. 
for me. I've heard all those things before. I met a man recently. He, was, he, was, he grew up in, the chur- in a church. I'm not even going to say which one. But he grew up in a church, not around here. His whole life went to church. And then one day as an older man, he, he, something happened. He, he met Jesus. And everything changed for him. It was like his whole life. And I had the lunch with him. And it was just this, we, were, we weren't there for a religious purpose at all. We were there for something totally different. And all we talked about was Jesus almost the whole time. <laughs> it was awesome. Born again Christian. Lovely, lovely man. And yet he said something that really, that really bothered me. He said, now my relationship with God is better than ever, and I don't have to go hang out with hypocrites on Sunday morning to get there. He said that, and it, it was like a little bit of my heart broke, okay? Because I thought, that can't be the church. That, that's not church, right? Tell me that's not church. Just a morning full of hypocrites that I suffer through. God save us from that. I mean, when he said that, it's like cut me to the heart. Because I love our church. I love the church. I love Christ's kingdom. When I read this scripture, the Our Father, you've said it a thousand times. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Right there at the beginning, Jesus says this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we recognize who God is, his holiness, his greatness, how beautiful our God is. And then immediately, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. And so what is the kingdom coming on earth as is in heaven? What does that mean? Yeah, that should be us, right? Of all the people in the world, the kingdom should be coming here in this building on this morning. The kingdom should be here. People shouldn't dread to come here. They should know that there's something special here that they can go to. But so many people have been so hurt and burned by churches in the past. They can't come here anymore. But they won't come here anymore because of all those reasons I laid out. And if I even just mentioned church, just that word just grinds on some people. You can see fire in their eyes when you say church. I've seen it happen. I've been in those conversations, you guys. I know that this is true. Hmm. So there's been these questions in my mind. What is church? And so that's what we're going to kind of try to answer over the next few weeks. I'm not sure how it's going to go. Today we're just going to get like a rough overview and then next week we're going to look at how Jesus did church and then we're going to look the next week at how Paul did church and um, just try to glean some things, take what's good for us and um, how we can maybe adjust what we're doing on a corporate level and most certainly on an individual level for what church is. You good with that? Long introduction, sorry. We looked at this scripture last week and I'm going to look at it again. Um, I've read this scripture probably a thousand times in the past six months. I mean, it's just like every single moment I keep looking at this and thinking, okay, God, how? How can we do this here? How can we do this here? This is Acts chapter 2. This is the very first church, so to speak. After Jesus is gone, the Holy Spirit empowers the original 70 disciples that were sitting in that upper room. You remember the story? And the wind comes and the tongues of fire come down on those 70 people and they begin speaking in tongues. And they're speaking in all these other languages. And it's a festival time, okay? It's a feast, Pentecost, 50 days after uh, (coughs) Passover. And so they're there in Jerusalem. All these Jews from all over, all these surrounding countries and nations are there. And these 70 believers begin to speak in tongues. And lo and behold, they're speaking in all the languages of all these Jews that have come to visit. And so they're hearing them speak. They don't even know what they're saying. 
They're speaking in tongues, and yet they're giving the gospel to all of these believers in all of their individual languages, and God takes the church from 70 people that day to 3,000 people that day in a moment. One sermon. Peter preaches one sermon. 2,930 people get saved. Like, let's make that happen, right? Um, We'd have all Catanning in one day. But then it says this. As they devoted themselves, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so I look at that church and I say, I wanna, I wanna just go visit that church for a little while. I wanna see what's going on there. Like that sounds pretty good to me. And we kind of narrowed it down, five things that were going on. Total devotion, signs and wonders. Remember this from last week? Contentment and generosity, true fellowship and lasting fruit. Um, we, saw, we see all those things in those scriptures, everything that's going on in that initial church. And I've just been asking myself, and once again, I don't want, <laughs> I really don't want this to sound like I'm unhappy with Living Water Church. But I know that's how this is going to sound. So just know that this, know my heart this morning, okay? Can we do that with our current structure? With how we do church on a regular Sunday morning, can we have total devotion? Can we prove our whole devotion in 90 minutes a week? No. Can't happen. Signs and wonders. Why would that be limited to, to here? Why should that be limited? Why should that stuff only happen in, the, in these four walls? Why can't I walk around with a bottle of vegetable oil in my pocket and when someone's sick I can go up and pray for them? Yeah. I can, right? Can't happen in these four walls. Not like they did it. Contentment and generosity. This can kind of happen here a little bit. We can, we can put money in the, in the box. We can do all those things. We can be generous with other people. We can help each other's needs. But how do you practice this when we have 100 people, 200 people? Who's holding you accountable? Who are you, who are you meeting with? Who are you talking to to learn their problems, to learn their needs? As you get bigger as a church, it just, it just doesn't work. True fellowship. How many deep relationships do you have from people you talk to five minutes every Sunday morning? We don't have a whole lot of time to talk to each other here, right? We worship. We listen to one boring guy drone on for like 40 minutes. We pray and go home, right? And so, where's the, where's the fellowship? Bold faith and lasting fruit. I wrote this down. How many of you feel your faith really stretched on Sunday morning? Feel stretching and molding on Sunday morning? A little bit? I do sometimes. You don't? Uh, see, I, I don't think it can happen here always. I think it has to happen outside of these walls. I wrote this down. How can... Absolutely. You're getting ahead of me, but you're good. You're good. <laughs> you're so right. You're so right. Like I said, I don't want this to come from like I'm not, I'm not frustrated at all. I wrote, how can they be saved day by day if we're only here week by week? That's what I wrote down. How can people get saved day by day if we're only here week by week? Right. Oh, we're getting some we're getting some activity this morning. All right. We're getting some people talking this morning. I'm excited about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we gotta keep our mind keep our eyes off the Steelers, right? Keep them on Jesus. 
Matthew 28 says this. This is the whole mission of the church, right? This is it. This is the whole mission. Jesus says, The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountains which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, right here, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's the Great Commission. We've heard it a thousand times, have we not? I mean, how many sermons have you heard at that end with the Great Commission? A lot. You've heard a, you've heard a lot from me, and I've heard even more from other people. But we've got to look at what Jesus says here. He says, go, therefore. Go, therefore. Go, therefore. And what do we do? We go out to people and we say, come. Come. I got this great building, great church. Why don't you come and try it out? I'm guilty, okay? I've, I've, I'm that guy. I tell people all the time to come. Who are we going to? When do we go? What's it look like to go? That's what Jesus told us to do. He said, go. Don't, don't come. Go. So that's the first one. Second one, he says, go to all nations. To all nations. And this is the review for the, from the class. So those of you, you can sleep for a moment. To all nations, not just some. And I think our tendency, okay, and you can tell me if you're like this, because I'm like this, I want to find the people that are like me, the people that are married and have three kids, and the, those people that are crazy and people that have chickens and all that crazy stuff that we do at our house. And I want to find those people and I want to bring them to church because those are the people that I'm going to get along with, that I'm going to talk to, that I'm going to mesh with, and I, I'd like to hang out with them more often. And so I'd just rather have them at church with me and then I can hang out with them a little bit every week. Is that you? That's me. I invite the people that I like. I invite the people that I want to be here. There's some people that I say, I don't want to spend any more time with you. Okay? <laughs> I know I'm not the only one that doesn't want to spend some more time with some people, okay? But that's not what Jesus said. Isn't that the people we should want? <laughs> Isn't that the people we should want to sit down with and let them mold and shape us and let us get over those hurts and get over those things that, that I'm going through? So you should be going to everyone, especially the people that grind on me. I should be going to them, tell them about Jesus. Lastly, Make disciples, he says. Make disciples, not attendees. See, a disciple was someone in Jesus' day, and we've kind of taken this word and molded it into something else. Now it seems like if you say the sinner's prayer, you're a disciple. That's, that's how we treat it. But a disciple in Jesus' day followed Jesus, okay? It was, a, it was someone who followed a teacher, followed a master, and tried to learn everything that they could learn from the master, Everything that they could possibly do. And when they had mastered everything, then they went out and found someone and told them and passed that information along. And so I would, I would venture to say that in the church in America, as a whole, we, don't, we have a lot of attendees. We have a lot of people that go to church every Sunday morning, but we don't have a lot of disciples. And that's exactly what Jesus told us to make. It's hard. This is hard for me, okay? So can we do that with our current structure? Can we fulfill the Great Commission with how that America wants to do church? I don't know. We've talked about this a little bit in, in our classes and this struggle that I have, and I wasn't going to go here today, but I'm going to do it anyway between how to grow a church. Because we, we are, you wouldn't know this this morning because there's not many people here, but there are some Sundays when I come in and there's not a lot of seats left. And so you start to wonder, where do we go from here? You know, if we would outgrow this, this building, should we go to two services? Should we look for a bigger place? Should we hire a full-time pastor? full-time kids ministry director, full-time youth director? Should we look at going those ways? Because that's, 
that's kind of the way that the world, that America likes to do church. We hire a professional person, and we hire another professional person, another professional person. And pretty soon, we have all these professional people that do ministry for us, and we come and attend. And the more professional it gets, the more people come, the more money there is, the more money there is to hire more professional people. And you can grow a church that way. You really can. We, I mean, there's, there's examples around within 50 miles of here. There's a dozen examples of how that works. But I just don't, I don't see that in here. And so that's what bothers me so much. Because I, I love seeing people saved. And I think there's even a better way than that. I think it's just found right here. You all with me? Or am, I, am I losing people? Okay. Your wheels turning this morning? Does this, this it bug you a little bit on the inside? Yeah? I want it to be a little bit uncomfortable for you. Here it is. In large, we talked this scripture last week too. We're going to talk about it in just a little bit different way today. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen the cords and strengthen the stakes for you will be spread abroad to the right and to the left and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. And so this is a prophecy in Isaiah it just says you, you have to be ready to constantly be stretching yourself. You remember this from last week? This is a picture of a tent. You're living in a tent, okay? And God says there's going to be some new people moving in. And so you've got to move the stakes of the tent out a little bit. You've got to stretch the tent a little bit. You've got to make a little more space inside because there's more people coming in. But it's really interesting. I, mean, I was thinking about this scripture, and it says your you offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. And I don't know why, but my mind went to, to, to Nazi Germany, okay? Germany was this beautiful, amazing, cultural mecca of the world. And then Nazism took over, and they began to just slaughter artists and church people and persecution and all kinds of things came to that nation, and they took the territory there. And then it was like as World War II raged on and you have the United States came in from the west with Great Britain and France and you have Russia comes in from the east and they took that territory back. And it was split down the middle. Remember the Berlin Wall? And so you had one, one side was, for lack of a better word, I'll, I'll just say it was the good guys, was taken by the good guys and they had freedom and the country flourished. And then you had this whole other side that was territory that was taken by, I just have to, I'll just call it the enemy. I'm just using this as an example. And they were oppressed. And they were under communism. And they could not flourish. And there was no freedom. And, and so you had territory. And then 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down. And gradually, freedom crept in and took over the territory of the east. You can go there today and it's still the east is different than west in Germany. Even though they have freedom and democracy and all these different things. But gradually, over the last, what is it, 80 years now? That territory has gone from completely under horrible oppression to taken back under freedom and democracy. And I'm just speaking in a physical government term, okay? I'm not talking about spiritual or anything like that. But I was thinking about that, about how we can see that all over the nation, our nation. We can see that all over the world. When those things happen, there's territory taken by evil, and then it can be taken back by good. And I want you to realize this morning that we're in a battle. We're in a battle. And we've, we've staked our claim, okay? This is our territory here. This building is ours. There's no evil that can come here. There's no demonic that has any power here. There's no dark spiritual force that can take Living Water Church. Because we're here. And Jesus is here. And the Spirit is here. 
okay? There's territory in our city that belongs to the enemy. I'm not the only one who believes that, right? There are places of darkness in our city. There are places of darkness in our county, in our state, in our country. It's a reality. But what this, <laughs> what this scripture says to me, it says, your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Who are the offspring that he's talking about? I think he's talking about the church. I think he's talking about the church because there was never a time after that where Israel went out and conquered nations. Never. The only ones that went out and conquered nations were the Christians. And we weren't conquering them by force. We were conquering them by, by salvation. That's how the first, the first church, when they just did church like this, when they just did it by the book, when they just did what Jesus told them to do, they went from 70 believers to taking over the greatest empire the world has ever known in 300 years. How? And they were persecuted the entire time. They were never allowed, so to speak, to do what they were doing. They were persecuted and killed the whole time, and they still took over. It's through the power of God, absolutely, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. They turned it upside down in 300 years. And so I want to just give you this this morning. We are in a war. A spiritual war. So we have to act like it. You have to understand that every single time that you talk to someone, see church doesn't end for me at 11.30 on Sunday morning. It's not over for me, and I hope that it's not over for you. And I'm not accusing anyone this morning. This whole thing for me is not, like I said, because I'm frustrated at all with Living Water Church, I'm not. I'm happy. I'm, I'm excited about where we're headed. But what I think is that if we would do church just by the book, if we would just do what the book says to do, we could see salvation in this city like no one has ever seen in Catanning, Pennsylvania. It can happen here. It can happen here if we act like it. So what you have to realize is when you go into the grocery store and you interact with somebody, every conversation, every step that you take outside of these doors, every person that you bless, every person that you give the gospel to, every person that you lead to the feet of Jesus, every person that you just have a friendly conversation with is an opportunity for you to take back a little bit of territory that belongs to the enemy. I just want to live with that mindset. I just want to know that there's people with darkness out there and that, and that God has given me the privilege and the permission to go and occupy that territory, to go and take it back for his glory, to go and win people to the Lord. How awesome a responsibility. I don't want you to feel burdened by all this necessarily, but I do want you to struggle and wrestle with this stuff. Because if we can just live out Acts chapter 2, if we can get these things right, let's go back. Total devotion, signs and wonders, contentment, generosity, fellowship, and lasting fruit. So this is exactly why life groups are so important. Dan Donna hit it right on the head, halfway through. Our goal this year, and this is, this is, this is me talking, okay? I've prayed through this, and I, I really believe that this is what God wants us to do. Right now, we have five life groups that meet off and on through the week. I believe that as a church, we could have 30 by the end of the year. That's going to sound crazy, doesn't it? Does that sound a little bit crazy? That's a lot of growth, okay? But some of our small groups are too big. Some of them have leaders that could be doing their own group. And there's a lot of leaders that can just start something on their own. And so how do we start? How do you start a group? Do you have to recruit and you have to have six people before you begin? No. You know how you start a group? You call someone on your, you call someone on your list this week and invite them over for dinner. I mean, that's all. <laughs> the whole Acts chapter 2 church, they didn't have a single church building. None. 
They have a single building to meet in. They met in each other's houses. They went to temple together, which would be like what we're doing here on Sunday morning. And then they went home with each other into their homes and had church. And this is what church looked like to them. Devotion, generosity, sharing with each other, sharing each other's problems, sharing in each other. This is what they did. And so that's my challenge to you. Over the next week, two weeks, invite someone to your house. Start a conversation with them about Jesus, about church, about what's just what's going on in your life. What are you struggling with? I can guarantee you that God is going to start to bless that. If you can just say, hey, let's make this a regular thing. Would you just come to our house every, every Tuesday night and have dinner with us? Start on this path. Seek, seek truth with me. Because I was talking about, at the beginning, all those things that people think about church, that they're holier than thou, hypocritical, that it's a waste of time, that people are mean and judgmental and all of those things. So you know, you know a lot of people that know that you aren't that way. And so when you have this conversation about the church, they say, well, I know, you, I know that's not you, but that's just, that's just church for me. So why not just let them start with you? Why not? Why? Okay. Yeah. They'd hang out with you though, wouldn't they? That's what I'm saying, where we've got to start. It's our oikos. It's these people that have, that have been around us. It's our family and friends and acquaintances, all of those people. We have to start with them somewhere because they are so hard-hearted. They're on, they're on your list for a reason. That's absolutely right. A lot of them are on my list for a reason. A lot of them I've talked to about church before, and it's like, Ooh, don't go there, man. Don't go there. But they'll come and hang out with me. They'll come and watch chickens with me. Come and do something silly with me like that. And guess what? Normally, if they're around me for any period of time, we're going to be talking about Jesus a little bit. They're okay with that. And gradually, you see those walls start to come down. See that wall start to crumble. And lo and behold, you get to take a step onto that territory that used to belong to darkness and now belongs to light. It happens. I've seen it happen in my life. I've seen it happen with other people. I've seen it happen with people who don't even go to this church. (laughs) I'm okay with that. So this isn't about living water church, it's about the kingdom of God. It's about the kingdom of God. So what if we were able to tell people that there was a different type of place? One that had people that were loving and accepting. Just a group of imperfect people seeking out truth together. A group of people that really helped each other. And when he needed something, they really came through. A group that just operated in freedom. A group that there was support and encouragement. A group that made you a better person. A group that bo- where there was both accountability and there was grace. And a group with, finally, real community. Isn't that what people want? Isn't that what the original church was? They just had real community. And I'll read about these cities, and they'll say there's a real sense of community there. And I think it's so sad that we have to settle for just a sense of community. That just to walk down the street, this place looks like it would be a really nice place to live. I want the real thing. I don't want a sense of community. I want to connect with you guys. I want you to be my best friends, and you are. You are. But there's more people out there that are looking for that. Why do you think people turn to alcohol and turn to drugs? Why do you think people commit suicide? There's no community in their life. There's no one, they don't think anybody cares. But you care. I know you do. We just have to start. We have to start. Open the doors of your home to somebody in the next couple weeks. Or go to their house. Do it there. Connect with some people that are on your list. And see what God does. See what he does. Amen? Are we good? Okay. Is there anyone else? Any questions? I feel like this is a day where we can talk. Is anyone like... 
Go ahead. 